uh, I would like first to thank Neboj Shana Kričenović, I'm giving full names, Marcel Van de Vorde, Elena Pikuta, and Richard Hua for accepting our invitation to talk in this webinar, which will be focused on production and use of biohydrogen. The event is the first one in a series organized by the World Academy of Art and Science and devoted to contributions of all sciences to sustainability and human security. The series is a part of the global campaign on human security for all, which was initiated by the United Nations Trust Fund for Human Security and WAS, the Academy. It has been going on since January this year. In the first part of the event, the four speakers will present their materials they have prepared for this occasion. Upon that, we will have a discussion among the speakers. If the time allows, they will be able to answer the questions from the audience if they are put. Let us begin. I'm asking Nebojša Nakicenović to take the floor. Nebojša, please. So first of all, I would like to thank you Nebojša and the World Academy for the opportunity to participate in this webinar. And I will give a, a brief general introduction about the future energy sources, systems, I would say, and how they might be transforming the future and what the role would be of hydrosity, uh, hydricity age. And you will see what I mean with this term a little bit later. So I prepared a couple of slides and uh, let me just start my presentation. Uh, so arguably, I would, I would say that the world is at the crossroads. I mean, we have experienced very explosive development over the last two centuries of industrial revolution, but many people are left behind. And we are right now, I would say, in global crisis, not just because of the war, the tragic war that's happening, but also uh, we have just emerged out of the pandemic. So the challenges are huge. But I would also argue that the world has achieved a lot, and I have three bullets here. Um, since over the last two centuries, global economy increased 100 times, energy 50 times, and carbon dioxide emissions about 30 times. So you can see that we are using resources a little bit more efficiently. Unfortunately, not efficiently enough. So the emissions have exploded, and uh, that has caused global climate change. Uh, about 1.3 degrees Celsius above the pre-industrial uh, levels right now. And on top of it, about 8 million people die, die prematurely because of the indoor air pollution and regional air pollution, all a lot to do with the energy. So I would uh, say that the achievement of the 2030 agenda of the UN with its 17 sustainable development goals and the Paris Agreement are a great gift to humanity and they would bring multiple benefits for the people and the planet. And as I will say in a few minutes, I think hydrogen has a, a large role to play and in particular biohydrogen. Now, let me just uh, go to the emissions. Uh, what you see here in the black curve shown on the left vertical axis are the global emissions growing at about 2% per year. We are close to 40 billion tons right now. This is a graphic, a graphic from the Global Carbon Project that I had the honor of uh, co-chairing for a number of years. And what I was alluding to is on the right scale is how much carbon is emitted per unit value added in the economy. And as you can see, this is declining, but it's not declining fast enough. And this is where I think the role of hydrogen would be in the future to have a much more rapid decline toward the zero. I came to this topic, if I make, uh, may start with a personal note, uh, almost 30 years ago, pretty much exact, uh, 50 years ago, half a century ago, uh, when I started working with Cesare Marchetti, who is, in my view, the fad, father of the hydrogen economy, the first paper he published in 1973. And we started collecting data about this evolution, as and you can see on the graphic. Again, I'm showing the carbon intensity of energy worldwide. And you can see that is declining. And why? It is declining because the world have shifted from carbon intensive energy sources, 
such as traditional uh, biomass to coal, uh, oil, gas, and now to um, to renewable energy energies and nuclear. And as a result of that changes, the carbon emissions worldwide are declining. So one couldn't take this um, this apart, so to say. Look at how much hydrogen, how much carbon and electricity reaches the, the consumers directly. And electricity is shown here in this green curve. It is growing rapidly. Carbon, in terms of hydrocarbons, the amount of carbon reaching the consumer is declining. And the hydrogen, shown in blue, it has been increasing and will pres presumably increase in the future. So I think this is a, a feature of the structural change and the evolution in the energy system and our societies that we are tending toward electricity and hydrogen and thus my expression hydricity as the future. Uh, well, this just summarizes what has happened. So I think it's easier to understand. On the left side, you have the various end uses of our economy, services that our economy provides, uh, for example, mobility through time. And on the right are energy sources from the beginning uh, to today. So we went from, as I said, traditional energy uh, to oil and gas. Uh, we went from horses and carriages to automobiles and and trains and so on. And now mobility, of course, with the, in the digital age is exploding. So what you can see is that the new energy sources, uh, whether it's renewables, bioenergy, or nuclear, all of them would be reaching the consumer either in form of electricity and hydrogen with a little ex ex exception of some of the heat that might be reaching the consumers directly. So this is a big structural change in the energy system. Now that started quite a while ago, and 200, almost 220 years ago, 220 years ago, I have to stress that, was the first hydrogen car ever built in 1807. It was internal combustion engine, and on the right is the first true fuel cell uh, hydrogen vehicle produced by GM in 1966. You can say that's laboratory level, and so it took well over uh, half a century to see the first uh, fuel cell cars powered by hydrogen offered commercially on the market. So it just shows how long the evolution is from the laboratory uh, through early investments to the pervasive diffusion. And so the hydrogen has been on the scene for a very long time. Now, if we talk about the future of the hydrogen, I think it is important also to note that there is a very deep uncertainty about technological and social change in the world. And the first thing I would like to observe is that future characteristics like costs of a new technology, let's say bio, uh, bio hydrogen, will depend on our action in the future, how the research and development happens, how the investments and market introduction occurs. And so one of the major mechanisms is improvement of an accumulation of experience and knowledge that improves the technology in time. But this is not linear. Usually people think that R&D comes first and then investment and then commerce, commercialization. No, it's an interactive process uh, with lots of feedbacks, nonlinear feedbacks that does the complexity and uncertainty. So this is what we need to keep in mind if you think about the future. So let me share with you some of this how the experience improves with technologies. Uh, please note that here I'm showing a double log scale. On the vertical axis is the cost of an energy technology, dollars per kilowatt. On the horizontal scale is, uh, uh, scale is the applications. It's a cumulative increase in the market. Uh, so without you know spending too much time on the detail, most impressive is this yellow curve. I've highlighted it with the red line. This is the improvement of photovoltaic cells through increased investments worldwide, in particular production in China. The costs have gone down by two orders of magnitude, and it's very similar with the other uh, other technologies. So the one thing that, to keep in mind is that at least in these cases. Uh, doubling of the global capacity of uh, one of the energy technologies reduces the cost on the order of 20 percent. Now, you, you will probably ask, what is the exception here going up the scale? Well, that's nuclear. 
in Japan and France. And uh, I would say that's forgetting by not doing rather, rather than learning by doing. And here's a hypothetical, the same hypothetical experience or learning curves for hydrogen technologies uh, from the Hydrogen Council. Again, cost on the vertical scale, cumulative deployment on the horizontal scale. And you can see this is about the same order of magnitude. They are anticipating costs increase, increases on uh, declines on the order of, let's say, 13 to 20% per doubling. So that's in the order of magnitude. And I hope that we will be investing in these new technologies, in particular biohydrogen, uh, in order to achieve these improvements and make hydrogen together with electricity one of the major energy carriers. And why is that possible? I would like to offer to you the hypothesis that small scale granular like technologies have much faster improvement or learning, technological learning, than the lumpy large ones. So on the vertical scale is again cost reductions in percent per doubling of the cumulative capacity that's shown on the on the or shipments that's shown on the on the horizontal scale. And the green uh, green lines indicate that the cost improvements on the order of about 20 to 30 percent for the small scale technologies listed on the right. But if you look at the larger scale technologies, then generally the learning is lower and in some cases even extreme. It's, it's negative in the sense that the costs increase in time. So this gives you, I think, an impression that hydrogen technologies from biological applications for bioenergy have at least a large improvement potential if uh, we invest in them. And I think the reason why hydricity might be the solution is that both hydrogen and electricity can be produced from any source. Those are they're sustainable as long as the source is zero carbon and environmentally friendly. They can be interchangeably converted to each other. And as energy carriers, they're renewable. You do, uh, basically, they don't require any additional resources. I think another factor that I would like to highlight that I think might empower uh, this process is the digital age that's coming upon us together with artificial intelligence and convergence of many digital technologies. I'm just trying to illustrate that here with a picture. Uh, on the top row, you have basically uh, technologies that are moving our economy from ownership to usership. That means much higher efficiency, shared economy. The red ones are uh, going more in that direction where you have peer-to-peer -peer services. And I think both hydrogen and electricity will be the central carriers for empowering this and, and for the digital machines themselves. And then on the bottom, you can see our, I think most importantly, our shift from automized to connected, from individual to systemic, I would argue, services that would be reaching the consumer. Again, I think favoring uh, zero emissions, flexible energy uh, carriers like hydrogen and electricity. So let me give you a couple of examples why I think this is oncoming age. As you know, we could buy hydrogen cars and many hydrogen services today, about one to 2% of global energy is converted to hydrogen. Um, last Sunday was the 100 Le Mans 24 hour endurance race. And the reason why I'm mentioning this is they have decided that starting 2026, the car that you see in the picture that led the, the, the race cars this year will be hydrogen. And I think this is important because we have uh, pervasive this, this uh, diffusion of electric cars, but they have a relatively limited range. And for races of this type, 24 hour race, you need an energy carrier that has high energy density and can be stored and that's hydrogen. So favoring hydrogen. I think another one in context of digitalization, um, I, let me symbolically call this the hives of swarms of new technologies. They could be robots, they could be drones, they'll be interacting. I think uh, uh, they will generate new emergent properties. Uh, they will be self-navigating most likely and already are. Many of, those uh, uh, many of those technologies that will require independent operation will need an energy carrier like hydrogen with zero emissions in combination with the fuel cell. And then the area that's most difficult to decarbonize is actually air travel, ships, um, 
uh, uh, and re applications in remote areas. And um, I wanted to show you um, a design, a possible future design of a hydrogen aircraft that might be built around 40, 2040, 2050. We don't have all of the technologies today to build such an aircraft. It would have photovoltaic cells, batteries to store energy. You see a turbofan at the back of the plane that would store energy on, on landing. And importantly, would have hydrogen fuel cells for the po electric power, in particular to reach the cruise altitude. And that's true for all of the electric plane designs that we have today. Uh, if they're long range, they will need additional energy source like hydrogen. So one of the questions as I'm coming close to my 15 minute uh, brief presentation is, this is how the energy system might look into the future. If you look at today, we are predominantly still fossil. So the effort is huge to become non-fossil in this scenario. And I think this is important for the hydricity age is efficiency should play, efficiency and sufficiency should play a very high ro role, avoiding energy consumption. But what, what would be consumed in terms of energy sources, you can see toward the end of middle of the century, they might be mostly non-carbon um, biofuels, uh, biomass, and including hydrogen and hydrogen from renewable energy sources. So the structural change might be ahead of us, and this is how this might look like if the world actually goes in that direction. And the good news is that would be consistent with stabilizing climate at one and a half degrees without a huge overshoot of that target in the long run. So I would like to close with this slide because I think sometimes pictures say more than, than graphics. You see five areas of, of services in our society, the trains, aircraft, communication system, individual mobility, and industrial processes. And I think you will agree with me that they have radically changed in periods of 20, 50 years. So by 2050, we should expect exactly the same. And I think what is really important is the vertical, that the, the systems are connected. And this is why hydricity. And so here are a couple of examples of end use technologies that would be hydrogen and electricity powered probably in many cases both, and hopefully such technologies will building a new system for a sustainable society into the future. So I will stop here. Thank you very much. Um, I'm, there are two reports if anybody wants to look at it. One is from the European Science Advisory process on the right about energy and on the left a uh, report of pro trying to provide scientific basis for the 17 sustainable development goals. Thank you very much. Thank you, Nebuisha. Uh, a very rich presentation. Uh, I hope there will be discussion on it. Let us uh, move on. And I'm asking now Marcel to uh, present his material. Marcel, please. Um, I'm also talking on the on the hydrogen technology roadmap uh, yeah, for the future. And uh, yeah, um, uh, my first slide gives also a picture about what we, uh, what the present situation is about the climate change problems and all the dirty in the air. And we see a little bit about the countries like China uh, is, is, is a special one. And then in the second uh, slide, uh, I just try to indicate already what I said uh, with my colleague before. Uh, we should try and do everything in order to reduce the uh, the carbon into the air in the future. And uh, yeah, I'm trying to demonstrate in this uh, lecture that hydrogen may also be an important player. But I also will indicate the uh, number of efforts are needed in order to become successful in the hydrogen field. The next one. Uh, yeah, the hydrogen technology roadmap. I think I would uh, come back later on on that one. The next one. Next slide. Uh, no, maybe it is useful to indicate. Uh, I don't know that the presentation was not really like I presented it. But uh, yeah, this slide tells you the following. In the production of uh, yeah, hydrogen, 
there are now seven different types of hydrogen. And there is only one type that is the green hydrogen, that is the clean hydrogen. That is the clean hydrogen which the whole world is now trying to obtain. But in practice, it is more or less the dirty hydrogen, like number two, not too dirty, number three, more dirty, number four, number five, number six, and number seven. There's only one which is the clean hydrogen. And main industry and the main society is interested in that type of hydrogen because if they start up with building plants like producing blue hydrogen or gray hydrogen or black they will certainly have problems in the future from the uh, authorities as they will say well you have you cannot produce hydrogen with which is so dirty and number two, three, four, and five, uh, yeah, they are dirty. And I will come back on number one, which is produced by electrolysis and all the others by very by different type of sources. And I think some of the next slides will demonstrate that. This slide tells you the following, the advantage of hydrogen. Hydrogen made from water in the electrolysis that is the green hydrogen. You start with water, you split water in hydrogen and oxygen. Now there is enough oxygen in the air, you don't have to store it, but the hydrogen have then to be stored. And once stored, you can use it again, hydrogen together with oxygen and produce again water. So you start with water, and you come back to water, and in the meantime, you produce a lot of energy for various types of applications. The next one. I think there are various ways in order to produce the hydrogen. You can do it by splitting water. And here, and the sun, the very high temperature to split water in hydrogen and oxygen with a lot of energy, high temperature. That could be a nuclear reactor, which had been demonstrated in the past in Zurich in Germany, where with the nuclear reactor that one could able to produce hydrogen by splitting water. But that is very high temperatures and very dirty intermediate chemicals which are used. But today it is not so practical anymore. And at the same time, it is one of the various two to seven dirty type of Hydrogen. Next time. Another type is to start from the biomass, also with pyrolysis, and then with pyrolysis, also a process which is known for a long time. You produce a gas that could be hydrogen, bio or salt or char. This process is also a process which has been used since quite a number of years. I was playing with that process even in the United States, in Colorado, maybe 20, 30 years ago. But I think it is still used, it will be used. It is an easy way, a relatively easy way to produce hydrogen, but it is not a hydrogen what the society in the future will need. But today it is very popular for many industri in many industrial applications. The next one. Now, this is just a, a type of uh, uh, the electrolysis. That is just a, um, a system in which you try. There are very many, many systems. Here I produce, in principle, three different systems, where an A, B, and C, and D, four different systems. But it is always the same. It is more or less that water comes in, and you will try to get on one side the oxygen and on the other side of the uh, of the electrode the hydrogen. And you could vary in the uh, oxygen on the anode and the hydrogen on the cathode. And there are various types of systems which have been used in the past and today still very popular. And a lot of work and research is being done in order to find the cheapest system 
that is the most important problem, the most critical problem in the electrolyzers. It is too, 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 too expensive. And one is now trying to find anodes, cathodes, electrolytes, systems, all kinds of developments of new materials in order to get cheaper systems. But they are still today worldwide. Research is being done from China to America to India, all over the world. But it is still a very expensive system. And the progress is not the progress what we expect. We should go much further than what is actually going done. And I come back on what had to be done in future on this one. Next slide. So here are some of the um, uh, reactions, but I think that will take my time and I will use my time for other applications. The next slide. Now, this one, I think, is quite an important system. In order to produce uh, the um, facilities, practical facilities today, that is, you have on the left and on the left uh, top, you have the sunshine and in the middle you have the wind. And with the uh, sun and the wind, you're making electricity in a relatively cheap way. And with that electricity, you will try it and you don't really uh, see it on the right hand side with the fuel cell. Or again, with electrolyzers, you have then cheap electricity. You will try then to get hydrogen and oxygen by electrolyzers. And that system, I think, will be the system for the next 10 to 20 years to be used. And many people, like uh, in Europe, but not only Europe, in China, and particularly in the Middle East, also in the United States, one is trying to develop these systems. I think it is number one worldwide uh, to have the sun, cheap sun, and then also the wind. In Europe, one puts it on the North Sea and other seas in Europe, where there is hopefully enough sunshine. We have some problems in Europe. It is not always the nice weather. And then also the wind, also again on the seaside, uh, yeah, to produce the electricity. There are also very big negotiations between Germany, between uh, many European countries, but also with the European Union uh, to have a contract with the Middle East, because in the Middle East there is much more sun. And also there is a lot of wind, even more wind than what we have on the, in the European area, in the Middle East uh, countries and uh, Qatar and, uh, and the other ones. Oman is very, very popular in that one. And there are very big contracts made with Europe and uh, yeah, these countries. And then to ship it from the, the, that hydrogen at the end uh, yeah, by uh, cargoes uh, yeah, to, to Europe. Now, uh, yeah, this is, I think, the most popular one. We can discuss that later on during the discussions. But that is, I think, the way to go. That is sun and wind to produce electricity, cheap electricity to split up via electrolyzers the water into hydrogen and oxygen. And this is the pure hydrogen, uh, what we are producing. One of the big problems what we have is more or less a political type of problem. What has been discussed mainly on the level of the European Commission is that, well, we had a very bad experience with, uh, yeah, well, a nice country, Russia, which, uh, yeah, a lot of energy in the petrol and gas came from Russia for Europe. But there was a certain problem that uh, yeah, politically uh, that one can cut some pipelines. And we have the same problem. What will happen if we are really putting all the freedom in the ends of the Middle East by the production of the uh, hydrogen via the sun and the wind? and to transport it then to Europe, what will happen when there will be once a problem with Europe, a type of political problem, a war, or you can imagine all kinds of topics these days, that this will also be very critical. So there is the policy today is to make the contracts with these countries and at the same time also to start a lot of pilot plants. And we have a number which are underway all over Europe. Next slide. 
Ja, dat is the same, but it is more or less in an industrial way of that is being done. Next one. Now, in my lecture, I had three parts. The first part is how to produce hydrogen. I've given a few examples of which type of hydrogen can be produced, what sources are being made, and at the same time also the clean hydrogen with electrolysis. Now, I should indicate that already in the beginning that hydrogen is a vector, is a kind of energy source, and this makes it uh, much more complex. In my lecture, I have three parts. The first part is how to produce the hydrogen. The second part is to store the hydrogen. I think we have to store it. And this is one of the biggest problems. I think hydrogen, a lot is being done in order to produce it, to generate, to synthesize it. A lot of research is being done on that field. But the second point is how to store the hydrogen. And here, this slide gives there are uh, various ways. You have the physical based topic that is with compressed gas or cold cryo systems and liquid hydrogen. That are ways which we can be used and for the time being they are used and most practically used. But there is also a kind of the material based uh, yeah, hydrogen that is to find materials which can absorb, absorb hydrogen very easily and that that hydrogen is absorbed very good so that it is not released and at the same time these materials should when you use or when you need the hydrogen they should the desorption should be very simple and there are now enormous amount of uh, your programs uh, yeah, and a lot of patents which are being made in this uh, area and I think the greatest effort which today, particularly in Japan, also in European and all over the world, also China, all over the world, uh, yeah, what they are doing is they are trying to find materials which just have the characteristics, try to absorb hydrogen in great quantities, that the hydrogen is good test, but at the end, if you need it, that you can dis dissolve it in, a, in an easy way. And I think that is probably the future. All the others, the physical based methods which we have today and which will certainly be used for the next years because of the absence of the other materials. But I can tell you, I personally was involved in the materials based at Max Planck Institutes in Germany where an enormous amount of effort has been placed already 20 years ago. But the progress is still very limited. But the storage of hydrogen is, I think, the main problem for hydrogen in the future. The next one, is, uh, yeah, the, the next one that is that about the storage of hydrogen, you can see here, the storage of hydrogen should be done in a, in, <laughs> on a way um, so storage is, I think is one of the main problems. I already said that uh, in order to store it in the proper materials uh, uh, would be the best solution, but it would not be the easiest one. Let us take the next slide. This gives then a kind of a resume on the, bo the, the, the bottom part that is the production of uh, hydrogen by coal, natural gas, solar, uh, etc and then to produce electricity and to make the electrolysis or with a nuclear reactor, thermally of nuclear reactor. And on the bottom part, you find then all the type of the applications, what we have, what you can do with hydrogen. You can use it in the transport, what already was said by a colleague before. But still, I like to put the point that to use them in transport is a very minimum. You can really <laughs> practically zero is except for the NASA, uh, where they put the uh, satellites to the moon or uh, yeah, such kind of applications of, of, of sport cars, but that are exceptions. I myself played a lot with hydrogen at NASA, the first man on the moon. That is where I learned about uh, hydrogen and also at CERN in the bubble chambers, CERN in Geneva in Switzerland. 
Uh, yeah, but for the rest, in respect to the fuel cells, it's still a big, big, great problem. But we really need it. And also the other ones for turbines, etc. It it be very difficult. And the progress, if you look by turbines, by Rolls Royce or by other kind of companies, MTU in Germany or in France, is extremely difficult. We miss the technology to do it. And I come back in a few minutes about all the problems, what we have with hydrogen and what research and technology should be done in order to get the production cheaper, in order to store it better. And then also in respect to the transport, because we don't have a proper proper infrastructure, and the infrastructure which is available at present for the uh, the transport of other gases cannot be used by hydrogen. Hydrogen is too small and can penetrate very easily there where it should not go. The next slide. So go to the next one. I think you can use it in many applications. In the next one, like in the car, very, very difficult, you know, to use it for cars. Still the next one. That is for the transport, but it's a very primitive way. What I said, we should really try to get it in another way. The hydrogen should not be put into the uh, liquid in the container or in another container. The next one. This is, I think, the solution for the future. I think it would be wise if we could have the hydrogen in the uh, stations where we have now the petrol. And that is one of the future targets, what we should try to get, that is the hydrogen gas into the stations. And that is what the society wants. But therefore, we have an infrastructure which is not available. And that is a very complex type of structure in order to make the infrastructure. The next one. I think I would like just to conclude by saying the following. One of the biggest problem of one of the big problems what we have, that's number one, that is the education. Hydrogen has not been educated during the last 50 years at technical universities, at universities. So we have not the engineers for the hydrogen available. That does not mean that there are some exceptions available, but in general, we don't have the education for hydrogen available. About the security on hydrogen that is not available. About the standardization on hydrogen on an international scale is not available. International collaboration is really missing here completely. And once more, the education is a very complex type of problem. It is today that at various technical universities in Europe, that again, courses on hydrogen are being given. And we don't have the engineers in order to build the so-called, uh, in order to, we don't have the research available for the electrolysis or for the production of hydrogen. We don't have the knowledge available for storage of hydrogen. So we are in a very primitive way. And in order to get a breakthrough that may take many, many, many years. Now, the situation about hydrogen is very important. But I think today it is important and tomorrow there are the electricity is important. And I think the competition between electricity and hydrogen is still a very debate. And the politicians, a number of efforts are being made, but I think the efforts should be a thousand, a factor thousand higher in order to get a great breakthrough in the hydrogen. And the industry in Europe is still very pessimistic as we are today, like in the transport, my colleague before, he was saying in, 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 in some lorries and in also a, uh, in sport cars and also in vehicles to the moon, etc. But uh, if you look about the airplanes and if you look about the cars, I think it is, a, it is zero practically used. And uh, we need a lot of research, fundamental research, applied research and industrial applications in order to get the breakthrough in the hydrogen in Europe and in the world. Thank you. Thank you, Marcel. Uh, we, we shall go on. Uh, the time is going on. Now I'm asking uh, Richard to present his uh, materials. Richard, please. Thank, thank you very much. Uh, I'm delighted to have a chance to talk with you about potential applications of Spirochaeta americana for biohydrogen production. 
The climate and energy crisis has uh, stimulated uh, the U.S. National Clean Hydrogen Strategy and Roadmap to stress the importance of developing zero and low carbon hydrogen to a sustainable and equitable clean energy future. The bipartisan infrastructure bill that was passed quite recently in the United States provided $9.5 billion for clean hydrogen development, and the recent Inflation Reduction Act provided additional incentives uh, by way of production tax credits. Uh, also, the 2021 Hydrogen Energy Earthshot was developed to stimulate private sector environments. These developments and stimulation from the World Academy of Art and Science led us to again reconsider the possible role of the uh, uh, haloalkalophilic spirochaeta americana that was isolated from Mono Lake for the anaerobic fermentation of zero carbon biohydrogen. 1939, Gaffon reported the discovery that molecular hydrogen could be released by water by photosynthetic activity of the green algae Cynodesmus obliquus. In 1993, Taguchi reported the isolation of hydrogen producing bacterium from termites. And in 2002, Siebert et al. cloned and sequenced the hydrogenase genes Hyde A1 and Hyde A2 from the green, green algae, Schlamydomonas reinhardtii. Hydrogen uh, from algae is high efficiency, but it can suffer from inhibition by oxygen produced during the photosynthetic process. In 2003, hydrogen was shown to be the primary end product of the fermentated metabolism of sugars by the novel anaerobe from Mono Lake. And NASA Marshall Space Flight Center funded research for uh, studies of hydrogen production by Spirochaeta americana uh, as potential for application to providing continual supply of hydrogen for fuel cells for the space station and for long duration space flights uh, for human exploration of the moon and Mars. This all started uh, at NASA in 1996 when David McKay reported evidence for nanofossils in the 3.2 billion year old meteorite from Mars. And in 1997, we established the astrobiology group at the NASA Marshall Space Flight Center to study microbial extremophiles and micro uh, fossils in carbonaceous meteorites in collaboration with Dr. McKay and his Center for Biomarkers in Astromaterials. This resulted in my expeditions to search for life in some of the Earth's most hostile environments. Uh, studies uh, of the permafrost of the Fox Tunnel of Alaska resulted in the discovery and, and uh, description of a new bacterium, Carnobacterium pleistocinium, in Antarctica of Sanguibacter gelida statuaria, and also in Antarctica underneath the ice uh, of Lake Untersee of William Whitmania Terazaki. But the main thing uh, was that we wanted to examine the possibility of searching for life on Mars. The most interesting possibility was to look for life in closed uh, uh, lake basins. Uh, in fact, uh, uh, images had real, revealed that there was actually water ice in Verastatistis borealis and in Korolev crater. So these volcanic impact craters on Mars contain frozen water ices. And as an analog of that, it was decided to look at uh, endorheic uh, basins on Earth, uh, Owens Lake in California. Uh, those studies resulted in the discovery of Spirochaeta dissipatotropha and Anero virgula multivorans. And in Mono Lake, three organisms, Spirochaeta americana, Tyndalia californiensis, and Dysulfonatronum thiodismutans. Mono Lake is most interesting because it's an endorheic basin. In the center of Mono Lake, there's the volcanic Paoa Island with very hot 90 degrees sulfur, uh, Celsius uh, sulfurous alkaline springs that emerged in Mono, in Mono Lake about 350 years ago. This is the spectacular images of Mono Lake. It has these tufa uh, columns of calcium oxide, calcium dioxide, and calcium carbonate hydrated. Uh, these are along the south shore. And on August 15, 2000, I collected black mud samples from the south shore with strong hydrogen sulfide uh, odor. 
anaerobically sampled under shallow water at temperature of 21.6 Celsius, salinity 7% and pH 9.9. .9. The primary producers of Mono Lake were studied by Kosielik and Herbs uh, in 1992, and they showed that the dominant uh, uh, diatoms in Mono Lake were uh, Navicula crucialis and some species of Nitia, such as the Nitia frustulum shown below. Uh, and on the right is a Navicula uh, that was actually photographed just about a month ago at DTU space in Copenhagen. One of the things that is most interesting about diatoms is, uh, uh, as was shown in the 1986 paper I published with the late Sir Fred Hoyle, that uh, there, there is a protein template that directs the fabrication of the, these very complex shells uh, out of a hydrated amorphous silica. And the polysaccharides include a structural uh, of the structural carbohydrates include uh, uh, glucose, mannose, uh, glucose, uh, and xylose. This is very interesting from the standpoint of benthic diatoms in uh, in Mono Lake. Also, a, a dominant form of life there are the picocyanobacteria, such as cy cy cyano cyanobium and Sinecococcus. In 2001 at NSSTC, Dr. Picuda obtained enrichment cultures and isolated three novel strains, MLF1, which is an anaerobic alkalophilic magnetotactic sulfate reducing heterotroph that is capable of growth on hydrogen without an organic source of carbon. ASPG1, Spirochita americana, is an obligate anaerobe, haloalkalophile, sugarlytic hydrogen producing spirochete, and APO, uh, Dendalia californiensis, is an obligate anaerobe, extremely uh, uh, haloalkalophilic, for forming acetogen. Uh, these uh, show the papers where these new species were described. And in the center, where you see the images of, uh, in the left, uh, Spirochita americana, and you see the live dead stain, the uh, green uh, forms are alive and the red are dead. Uh, and it just to the right of that, you can see the, uh, the flagella that is actually typically confined within the paraplasmic space. In this TEM image, you see where it has been released. So you can actually see the flagella. And next is Tendalia californiensis and the right to sulfonatronum thiodismutans and the phylogenetic trees shown below. This is an image showing a video showing the motility of Spirochita americana. Very, very beautiful, very tiny, thin, but long microorganism. Uh, after Dr. Uh, Picuda had obtained enrichment cultures, uh, it was possible to not only study the locomotion and motility, but she was also able to do precise char characterization of all of the uh, uh, microbiological uh, features of this unique organism. This shows Spirochita americana uh, number three compared with other spirochetes. And the most important thing that I want to point out is you see in bold that Spirochita americana produces hydrogen. Uh, the main reason that these various studies were performed were to find out how it uh, how much hydrogen it produced in comparison with other uh, spirochetes, uh, as it's shown in this table, free living spirochetes, and it turns out that Spirochita americana is significantly greater producer of hydrogen than all of these other very interesting microorganisms. In 2016, Spirochita americana was reclassified into the new genus Alcala spirochita. And in this phylogenetic tree, you can see at the top uh, Alcala spirochita cellulosivorans, which is the type species for this new genus. Uh, and the interesting thing is cellulosivorans is actually able to consume uh, cellulose and it was isolated from uh, uh, the gut of a wood-eating cockroach, uh, Cryptosaurus punctilutus, and uh, therefore uh, that was formed the basis of this new genus. In conclusion, the heat value uh, 
of hydrogen is the order of 2.7 times that of petroleum fuels. The main hydrogen production method today is by steam reforming of fossil fuels, but the contribution to climate change is non-sustainable. In fact, it is not a clean mechanism for producing hydrogen. It is thought that clean hydrogen can be produced from uh, microorganisms such as Spirochita americana by fermentation of sugars. Further research is absolutely necessary to investigate how one may obtain low cost of feedstocks uh, such as sugars from alkalophilic benthic diatoms, picocyanobacteria, or carbonate rich uh, organic, uh, uh, carbohydrate rich organic waste. And it is important to determine the new technologies that can be obtained in order to make this possible on industrial levels. And with that, I thank you very much for the opportunity to present this to the World Academy of Arts and Science. Thank you. Thank you very much, Rick, Richard. Uh, a lot of information and you were also not pretty long past. I'm ask, asking Lena now to, uh, to present uh, materials. Please, Elena. Yes, by hydrogen production. Um, on the website of energy department, uh, it says that hydrogen can store and deliver clean energy for many uses across economic sectors, including transportations. It has the potential to reduce air pollution, such as greenhouse gases from trucks, buses, planes, and ships. Greenhouse gases trap heat and contribute to climate change. The transportation sector is responsible for 29% of this emission. So on the website airbus.com innovation, you can find all kinds of news promising um, planned um, commercial flights that fly entirely on hydrogen for 2024. Also for air buses, hydrogen is promising decarbonization technologies for aviation. It's also described there and uh, plans to bring a low carbon commercial aircraft to market by 2035. So if compared with gasoline, energy in one kilogram of hydrogen, it's equal to energy in one gallon of gasoline. And one kilogram of hydrogen could uh, allow to ride 60 miles compared with a gasoline, one gallon, 25 miles. So um, to start talking about bacterial hydro, hydrogen productions, um, I should say that all um, living organisms on Earth divided on two groups. Uh, first group, producers of organic matter, and second, uh, decomposers of organic matter. So what we will talk today about bacterial hydrogen productions, it's a second group, um, the composers of organic matter. Even so, we know that phot photosynthesis of photolysis of, wa uh, of um, water also could create hydrogen, but it's uh, producing uh, explosive um, mixture of hydrogen with oxygen, which is highly um, combustive, a very dangerous mixture. So, um, we will talk about fermentations today. So fermentations in the microbial world divided on saccharolytic and proteolytic bacteria. So in anaerobic ecosystems following groups of lithotrophic microorganisms, lithotrophics, it's mean not organic eating, but uh, using hydrogens and other inorganic uh, compounds for food. So this organ is uh, competing for hydrogen. So sulfate-reducing bacteria, acetogenic bacteria, and methanogenic archaea. So enzymes of these microorganisms have a very high affinity for hydrogen molecules. So in nature, hydrogen producers tightly associated with hydrogen-consuming bacteria. Both the producers and consumers of hydrogens equipped with special enzymes hydrogenases. Uh, which located in periplasmic space of gram-negative bacteria, it's membrane-bound hydrogenases. Some of them could be soluble, 
and uh, third group, regulatory hydrogenases. For industry, gram-negative bacteria are preferable since no spore formations occurs during continuing batch cultivations. So the process cannot be stopped. And um, the Sparachita americana or alkali Sparachita was isolated from alkaline monolake like Richard was showing previously. And uh, this is free living. Free living, it's mean not pathogenic spirochetes required for growth buffer system with pH 9, 10 and uh, marine uh, salinity, seawater salinity. So this water could be used, uh, these solutions could be used for sterilizations of wound uh, because um, it's a very aggressive um, media. So no pathogens will survive in this soapy saline water. So it was isolated as a satellite of the hydrogen consuming sulfur reducing bacteria. So it was a side product of our investigation. So we were not um, um, targeting this organism. We were hunting the sulfonatronum tioreducens, which is a lithotrophic sulfur reducer. And uh, in, we, it was shown that in vitro, this bacteria, Sparachita and uh, this uh, disulfonatronum uh, tioreducens species grow better in binary culture since sulfur reducing bacteria removes inhibiting concentrations of hydrogen for sugar lytic spirochete. So they were good to each other. Both these bacteria are gram negative, not spore forming, with wide spiriplasmic space within, within cell wall and um, Comparison of these hydrogenases of both of these organisms may show uh, tremendous similarities. Also, comparison of genes responsible for these enzymes correspondingly may demonstrate the gene transfer. So, on later picture, I will show how look this um, uh, um, sulfur reducers. You will see peels uh, surrounding um, surface of the cells. And uh, they could be responsible for um, tra gene transfer processes. Some hydrogenases have reversible functions of uptake and release hydrogen molecules, but others have a restricted one direction functions. So what this sugar pro hydrogen producing bacteria was uh, using for food. So it was um, taking sugars from algae, photosynthetic alkalophilic cyanobacteria, and diatoms, producers of organic matter of this lake. On the left side, you could see a list of the sugars that were described in the original article for species descriptions. And second uh, column, it's uh, additional sugars that were checked already for biohydrogen pro productions project. So all... Um, sugars supporting growth of the spirochete. So grown biomass of this uh, producers of organic matter and ecosystem is degraded at soapy, highly mineralized carbonated water solutions where temperature may reach 55 degrees C in summertime. Products of dissipated algal biomass serve as a growth substrate for primary and secondary anaerobes in the trophic chain of the biome. Enzyme activity of protein sugarlytic bacteria accelerates the bioremediation and recycling organic matter in the system. Final products of fermentations, hydrogen, CO2, CO, and volatile fatty acids are used as donors of electron and metabolism of lithotrophic bacteria and archaea. So quality, uh, qualitative um, measurements were performed for characterizations of species, and it was found on gas chromatographs that only two gases were produced during growth of this uh, unique spirochete. So CO2 and hydrogen, um, and um, this is uh, a 29 hours incubations of strains on defructose. So in 44 hours incubations, we have to switch off sensitivity of the measurements because it was increased uh, tremendously. And uh, hydrogen um, and CO2 also increased. 
So then we checked um, all list of sugars available in laboratory and find out what the highest um, productions of hydrogen on which sugar. And it was shown that D-glucose definitely uh, demonstrated um, highest productions of hydrogen. And the lowest was found on a starch. Uh, this is um, all parameters of the measurements which were described in original article and methods and techniques. And that um, peaks on the left side, you could see the standard, which is 100% hydrogen. Actually, it was 80% of hydrogen because it was mixture CO2 plus hydrogen for standard. And then uh, the same volume of the sample from gas phase of the Sparkate American. And you could see that it's very high, 57%. So it's probably around 70. Uh, also, we uh, measured for balance um, consumptions of sugars. So this is a method for also described in the original article. And it was shown, calculated that on one mole glucose, four mole uh, of hydrogen were produced. So its uh, measurements was 5.5 millimole and it's produced 20 millimole of uh, hydrogen, which is proportions one to four. So this is the working proportion. Conclusions on this study at the Astrobiology Lab was made that by-productions of hydrogen could be safely performed at big scale batch cultivations. Anaerobic exit of hydrogen and CO2 is safe, not explosive gas mixture. Applied growth medium inhibits development of pathogenic contaminations as well as competitive for hydrogen methanogenic archaea. The best yield of hydrogen was observed on D-glucose and D-fructose, and the batch cultivation demonstrated correlations between optic density along with cell number count and hydrogen gas produced. So this could be used for future estimation of the process. And these results were presented in 2004 at the astrobiology meeting uh, with, uh, at SPIE in Denver. And uh, this is uh, our photograph in newspaper, Marshall Star, where the article on first page was dedicated to biohydrogen productions at Marshall Space Flight Center. So next um, portions of information I wanna give you about hydrogenases. So hydrogenase is the key enzyme of catabolism in cell and it catalyzes converse reactions of hydrogen oxidation. Uh, hydrogens equal two protons and two electrons. So this enzyme responsible for consumption and excretions of hydrogen. These enzymes were found in prokaryotes, including aerobes, facultative anaerobes, phototrophs, and obligate anaerobes, which is methanogenic, acetogenic, nitrogen fixing, and sulfate reducing bacteria, and archaea. Also, these enzymes were found in eukaryotes, such as algae, protozoa, and higher plants. They may consume hydrogen as energy source or as uh, electron sink. In dependence upon metal in active center, these enzymes are classified on ferrum ferrum, nickel ferrum, nickel ferrum selenium, and metal free hydrogenases. So we studied hydrogenases at the, uh, on the disulfonatron and tiodismutans, um, which is a chemolytotrophic sulfate reducing bacteria capable of growth on hydrogen plus CO2 by reductions of sulfate to hydrogen sulfide. This organism also capable to perform reaction dismutations. That's why it's uh, named uh, the sulfonatron and tiodismutans. So dismutations or inorganic fermentation. So the only end catabolic product at growth of on formate or hydrogen with uh, sulfate reductions is uh, hydrogen sulfide. All these features explain high activity of hydrogenase and its resistance to high pH and salinity. So this is um, morphology of this uh, sulfur reducer. Um, on the left side is gram stain, uh, typical red coloration. And on the right side, it's transmission electron um, 
microscopy image, you could see um, polar flagellations from both sides. I think it's dividing vibrion. And you, uh, as I promised to show you, um, tiny hair-like um, filaments surrounding entire surface of this vibrion. It's um, just surrounded. So the, it's mean this bacteria could uh, transfer uh, part of genomes of genes responsible even also for hydrogenases and uh, request um, conjugating organism to produce more hydrogen for food of this organism. So that's how it's uh, related and connected to Sparakita americana. So they are like binary culture behaving like um, um, collaborators. So physiological optimum ranges of um, this organism shown on the right side was significantly actually narrower and smaller than functional enzyme on the left. So you could see that uh, sodium chloride uh, optima, it's uh, twice higher. This is in molar concentration, this is on a, in percent. So one molar, one dash two is approximately six, 12 um, percent uh, sodium chloride. And also was investigated dependence of hydrogenase on, upon bicarbonate. And it was found that it's only tolerated, not um, required for growth. pH uh, optima approximately this, uh, exactly the same, but the range of the enzymes are higher. So high activity of hydrogen oxidizing hydrogenase of this organism indicates the enzyme perform catabolic functions by participations in discriminatory fat reductions. And uh, hydrogenase able to function at high pH and uh, high concentrations of sodium chloride. All these features suggest that enzyme is a unique subject for diverse biochemical research and define the potentials for biotechnological application. It was presented on the conference 2004, Astrobiology. And first author was um, Dr. Ditkova from Institute of Microbiology, Russian Academy. And uh, Richard and I, we were in the uh, course. So future development and bacterial, bacterial uh, hydrogen productions. It's, of course, genome study, genes associated with hydrogenases to determine um, if hydrogen productions can be improved, measurements of enzyme activity of hydrogenases for increasing yield of hydrogen, and work with engineering and gas equipment development for continuing and batch cultivations on big scale um, industry. And material science, of course, may develop a novel sponge-like materials for absorption and storage of hydrogen in small portions with consequent slow release for engine safe, not explosive technology. And um, also a few words about uh, sequencing. So Department of Energy Joint Genome Institute performed draft sequencing on the number for Alcalis Paraquita Americana and uh, the dismutants, uh, it was actually sequenced earlier. So, and uh, this is example of genes number for hydrogen, hydrogen dehydrogenase, which need to be studied and compared. And in, we would like express in acknowledgement, we would like express our deepest gratitude to Russian Academy of Science, particularly to Dr. Uh, Zhilina for suggested chapter in my PhD dissertations without which this work could not be performed. Also, thanks to NASA, Marshall Space Flight Center and the National Space Science Technology Center facilities and administrative work for funding this research, support and interest to, to our work. And also special thanks for um, AAS for today's meeting and opportunity to present and discuss potential applications for this research. That's it. Thank you. Thank you very much, Yelena. Uh, we have uh, uh, 10 minutes only for discussion, and I'm uh, giving uh, 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 a chance that the first question should be put by Gary Jacobs, who has been following uh, the, the, the whole session. He is the president and CEO of the World Academy of Art and Science. Gary, I hope you are present. I know that you have a question for Elena. Please put it. Gary. Gary. 
Thank you. Actually, I had questions for all of the very interesting speakers. <laughs> and uh, also my thanks to you, Nabosha, for organizing this very interesting uh, program uh, of speakers. Uh, I was trying to, well, there were, I, I have put questions in the chat for all of you. Uh, but the last one, which I did direct to Elena was, you mentioned that the anaerobic uh, process would, for generating uh, the hydrogen was also generating CO2. And it just occurred to me since our concern is a fuel that's, uh, uh, that's producing energy without com com complicating our problems with CO2, uh, whether that's a significant relationship or not. Um, the problem is that CO2 will be totally absorbed by bicarbonate system. So it will be uh, held inside uh, okay, of captured. the liquid media. So it will be very easy to separate and put it back to carbonates. Okay. So mineralize, we can mineralize it immediately. So it's really, really, really um, good. <laughs> it's very nice. Good. Good. Yeah, you. and percent of CO2 like five, 10 times less than hydrogen. So mm -hmm. this amazing okay, bacteria. Was... When you're growing bacteria, you can shake it on second day and you will see bubbling like champagne, uh, uh, little bubbles um, because it's hydrogen. A CO2 immediately dissolved in a buffer, high pH buffer system. So it will never go on top. So and have there is... been, I'm, I'm, uh, have there been efforts to, uh, project uh, commercial feasibility of, of using this on a large scale? Well, the commercial scale um, estimations, it's need to be done a lot of work. So what was done, it's basically batch cultivation, which is uh, well sealed. And um, because with all this continuing, we need special engineering, all these tubes, all these connections, because it will be escape, hydrogen will escape all silicon tubes, all, I don't know, connections need to be done. And it's very dangerous. University didn't allow me to perform work in my laboratory. So it should be special facility. Now, I would like to add something also. Uh, at the time this was done in 2003, 2004 time period, electricity and, and fossil fuels were much cheaper. And uh, of course, the the concern over climate change was not nearly as acute as it is today. Uh, we moved on to studies of other microorganisms uh, collected from other expeditions. And, uh, uh, but actually we had not thought about this until Nabosha uh, invited us to participate mm -hmm. in this wonderful program. And uh, after uh, being Again, uh, thinking about it, uh, we realized that the world has changed dramatically since 2003, 2004 time period. And we're very much hoping that we can develop uh, collaborations where uh, there are people that know far more about the techniques for storage and, uh, and large scale production than we do. Uh, engineers that are extremely knowledgeable about uh, massive fermentation facilities and so forth. So that's what we're hoping can come out of this is that we can actually begin to, to formally find a position in a laboratory where we can continue this research uh, to uh, hopefully bring this to where it can become uh, economically feasible. Wonderful. Well, between all our speakers, maybe we have the expertise we need for that work. <laughs> it, it, I also would like to add that since 2004, when we uh, reported this um, data, no much um, change, no much changes in, in the diversity of uh, candidates for the hydrogen productions. The most uh, candidates were pathogenic clostridia. Clipsiella, which is no good on big scale. You can Terrible. imagine, yeah, in giant uh, tank to grow these pathogens. It's very dangerous. Mm -hmm. So these bacteria are really, really um, safe. And even if it will be put it on a wound, open wound, nothing will happen. It will still heal your uh, tissues. So from this point of view, it's very uh, promising. Thank you very much. Thank you all. Okay.
very much. We are uh, almost we, uh, at the end uh, of the event. Now I'm asking uh, Nebojša, I know that he has a question and uh, please uh, put it and uh, yeah. decide who, who would, would you like to answer. <laughs> yeah, yeah, thank you. Uh, <laughs> to speak. Uh, I, I found this really, really exciting presentations, actually all three. And mm -hmm. I would have now after Gary's question, um, I uh, would like to follow up in the same vein. Uh, the, uh, the world is very late in reducing the carbon emissions. And in fact, we are going to have an overshoot. So many of the studies about how to stabilize climate indicate that we need ne net negative emissions in the future. And Elena has pointed out that I think the, uh, the bacterial source of hydrogen in the research that you're working might be suitable for that, if I understood correctly, because cellulose would be, let's say, biological origin, would have carbon. And if you're separating CO2 after producing hydrogen with bacteria, CO2 could be stored. And I, that would be actually the same question to Marcel, um, uh, because I think all of the other biosources could do the same in principle. So um, I, I just wonder whether we have brief answers to that or comments. Somebody was asking question about how do you uh, imagine of this uh, technology. So we, we discussed it with Richard and came to conclusion. So it should be like two giant tanks. First tank will be with biomass of uh, photosynthetics, which required light. So it could be on surface and underground could be giant tank for the Sparakeet Americana, which will already producing hydrogen. So this is uh, requirements of two separate uh, tanks, aquariums. <laughs> Yeah, and that would be in principle scalable, I assume. So yeah, so photosynthetic will be degraded partially, then filtrated, and then already saved um, purified uh, glucose or whatever sugars. Maybe we'll discover some new types of sugars, <laughs> and um, also, will use it. Also, other other scientists in several places are are looking at uh, the nanoporous aspects of diatoms uh, for. Uh, for storage of hydrogen, uh, uh, which is a completely different kind of approach where there's nanotechnology being uh, applied to this very important problem. Okay, uh, Marcel, uh, we have a few more minutes. Would you like to put a question or to give a comment on all uh, what we have heard? Please, Marcel. Negosha, it was quite interesting to listen. In respect to what is bio and everything related to that, what uh, Elena and uh, I personally was involved in 2003 and 4 in Denver and in Colorado in the United States by programs which has been supported by the NASA and also programs where the European Space Agency had an interest in it. I am just uh, uh, wondering how long will that still take when that project becomes a reality in the society? That's one of my big questions. I also saw at the Department of DOE and the new program in the United States that they are not spending too much money on that one. I think that should be much more encouraged that mm. you watch more universities mm. and research centers uh, uh, from the DOE are much more involved in that one. We in Europe, we have still that fundamental research going on in Max Planck Institutes. And I would strongly encourage you to take contact with three Max Planck Institutes in Berlin, in Heidelberg, and uh, um, also in Cologne, we are doing still work, similar, similar fields. But to my field, it is still in the fundamental research. It is very difficult to get a take off in that. In respect to the topic about what Nikosha uh, was mentioning, I think you are well placed in respect to the analysis for the future. But you have not said in your speech, when will there be a breakthrough? into the hydrogen. You are mentioning that energy is popular in transport cars, in NASA, uh, in such kind of also the Iran uh, uh, vehicles that Russian is sending to Ukraine 
is also on that level uh, with nanotechnology. But the point is, when, how do you see, when will it come? I personally, from the knowledge I have in that field, I've even written three books recently on hydrogen, hydrogen process synthesis, hydrogen storage, and also hydrogen into the applications. And also there are a number of chapters on the bio in it and also in the future uh, orientations. I personally think that what I presented about the solar plus the wind to produce cheap electricity, and from that one to split water into others and oxygen, that is the future. There was also in WAS a big event which they participated in uh, Las Vegas, if I remember well. They can only use that type of hydrogen. They cannot use all hydrogen. They can only use the pure hydrogen in the whole semi and electronic industry. It's only the pure. All the other processes, they contain too much carbon as if they make from, from coal or hydrocarbons and you transfer it into hydrogen following their processes. They, they, are, they are containing so much carbon, which will produce CO2 and everything. So it will be very difficult in the new regulations in the future worldwide that these processes can be used. These companies who are producing this from all carbon-oriented systems to get hydrogen, they will have big problems in future as the regulations will be stricter and stricter. Therefore, the whole world is today looking into the electrolysis. But the electrolysis is a big problem that is too, too, too expensive. And the whole world is principally also looking into systems and in materials and in electrolytes in order to get cheaper systems. But that is the only way where we have to go and uh, yeah, for the production of uh, hydrogen. And the storage of hydrogen is also a very big uh, problem. I think it is not the best way, it's not by pipelines. And we don't have the infrastructure and the pipelines there it cannot be used because the hydrogen go through it. So we have new pipelines that is taken enormous effort. And to get by ships to transport it like the oil is transported today, I think it's not the way. We have to find out systems in order that we can store the hydrogen in a proper way. And here also an enormous amount of effort all over the world uh, is being put into that system. And uh, yeah, I think and I hope that following the forecast of the International Energy Agency in Paris, that we can get the stations which I presented that we can have by car, that we can get and fuel at stations where no petrol is taken, that we can get the hydrogen from the stations. That's what I hope, but it is very optimistic. And the hydrogen goal, I think personally, is very important. I'm personally interested. And I would really encourage that about the topic which you have been presenting about the bio and the fermentation and so on, that there is much more money. Uh, I think we need a lot of money for the processes we are being developed. But for that one, we should encourage the whole world in do much more work. But there's not much going on. Japan stopped that program. The United Nations, the United States, not much being done on it. And China is not doing anything on this kind of thing, by my knowledge and by their statements. So uh, I think we uh, should for hydrogen, and I think that is the point to, um, to Bosha once more. You're sitting there in Austria in, a, in an institute where they're not only doing uh, forecast and forecast and forecast. I think it would be very useful to come out once with a very good plan, but also with a budget plan. And also with the education, because we don't have the engineers today available in order to build the pilot plans. And we don't know what are the safety criteria, because hydrogen and oxygen is really explosive. And it's like a kind of hydrogen bombs, like atomic bombs. And we have not this point under over control. So there is still a lot of 
fundamental research needed, applied research in order to come to the hydrogen. But I think one should put the effort in it in order that hydrogen get a good place for the time being in Europe, in the car and other industry is only 1% of the total. And that is not uh, yeah, enormous. And uh, in order to get from 1% to 50% or to 80% or 90% is a long way still to go. And it is the research and technology we have to bring the offers as the politicians and governments are waiting for this information. Okay, Marcel, uh... it was, it should really put a present of a document together and to present it to the governments. Thank you, Stuttgart. Thank you very much, Marcel. Uh, we are at the end uh, of the meeting. Uh, I would like to thank uh, uh, to the speakers, first of all, very much. It was rich, rich, very rich. Yes, it was. Michelle, uh, we have the presentations. Perfect.